Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ, where whoever you are and wherever you are on life's faith journey, you are welcome here in our church family. Uh, glad to see you this morning and this Sunday um, after Election Day. Um, if you wouldn't mind, the bulletin went out in Big Mouth, so you might have a copy of that at home if you're joining us online. Um, and we start with the welcome, which is kind of like our old call to worship, but we haven't been doing that much. When we call upon God's wisdom, she will answer. When we celebrate voices proclaiming wisdom in women's faith, strong amid challenge, she will answer. When we seek God's wisdom, she dwells in the midst of life. We honor women's lives today, forging new paths and calling us into a future. When we follow God's wisdom, she leads us in the path of light and generosity. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Holy God, out in the open, your wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. She beckons to all to hear her pour out her thoughts and make known her teachings. Listen, she says, for I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to what is right. We hear echoes of your holy wisdom in Jesus Christ, the one you sent to dwell in our midst and to lead us to abundant life. Keep us alert in the call to follow. Be ready to respond with justice and joy in your holy moment, which is always now. Be with us in this hour and always in our hearts. Amen. <clears throat> the wind is going to possibly take down the roof this morning. It's uh, going to have the wind to join us. God's joining us through the wind on this very day. Um, this is the last, the conclusion Sunday of the series of Strong Women in the Bible. And the woman that uh, we selected for the Sunday, or I selected, was Judith from the book of Judith, which is an apocryphal book. Um, and we talked about Judith in Bible study, but in the process of trying to share the scripture of Judith with you, I could not get it down to anything less than twice the length of my sermons. So I decided to paraphrase instead. Um, the book of Judith is 16 chapters long. The first seven chapters are about battle and war, and then there is um, nine chapters that are about Judith's, Judith's interventions in the war. So I'm going to tell you about it and just read a few of the prayers and words in the interest of time. So the book begins by saying it was in the 12th year of Nebuchadnezzar, the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, who ruled over the Assyrians, the king of the Assyrians, it says over and over again. And the people of Yahweh are stuck in a no-win situation because Nebuchadnezzar uh, wanted to have everyone join his war, and all who refused then incurred his wrathful justice. He pledged to destroy anyone who did not join him in war, and the people of Israel were one of the many tribes from a huge swath of, of, of land that were going to be um, targets of that. Uh, and at, after the seven uh, chapters of fighting, they are now trapped in a situation with their food and their water sources cut off, and the people are faint with thirst. And they decide at this time that they're going to give it five more days and then surrender. Five more days for, for God to show his hand and to make something change. Judith is a wealthy widow who lives in a town named Bethulia, uh, who must be an important enough widow to be listened to by the male elders in the town square. Now contrast this with Susanna, who we read about last week, who wasn't even allowed to testify on her own behalf when she was accused of adultery with an unknown lover. Judith hears that the leaders have decided to surrender themselves into slavery uh, under Nebuchadnezzar if God doesn't change their fortune in five days. But to Judith, this is an unwarranted test of God. And she goes to the town square, she requests an audience with the elders, and she says, Listen to me, rulers of Bethulia, what you have said to the people today is not right. 
You have even sworn and pronounced this oath between God and you, promising to surrender the town and our enemies to our enemies, unless the Lord turns up and helps us within so many days. Who are you to put God to the test today and to set yourselves up in the place of God in human affairs? You cannot plumb the depths of the human heart or understand the workings of the human mind. How do you expect to search out God who made all of these things and find out his mind or comprehend his thought? No, my brothers, do not anger the Lord our God. For if he does not choose to help us within these five days, he has the power to protect us within any time he pleases, or even to destroy us in the presence of our enemies. Do not try to bind the purposes of the Lord our God. Therefore, while we wait for his deliverance, let us call upon him to help us, and he will hear our voice if it pleases him. Therefore, my brothers, let us set an example for our kindred, for their lives depend on us, and the sanctuary, both the temple and the altar, rests upon us. In spite of everything, let us give thanks to the Lord our God, who is putting us to the test, as he did our ancestors. The elders of the town listen to her and say she is very wise, but they still say we cannot change this oath any longer we have decided. So we pray, we ask you to pray for us to have rain so that we do not, you know, die of thirst. She tells them that she'll take matters into her own hands, but she does not tell them her plan. And then she goes back home and prays. Her prayer goes like this. O oh God, my God, hear me, a widow. For you have done these things and those that went before and those that followed. Here now are the Assyrians, a greatly increased force, priding themselves in their horses and their riders, boasting in the strength of their foot soldiers, and trusting in shield and spear, in bow and sling. They do not know that you are the Lord who crushes wars. The Lord is your name. For your strength does not depend on numbers, nor your might on the powerful. But you are the God of the lowly, the helper of the oppressed, the upholder of the weak, the protector of the forsaken, the savior of those without hope. Please, please, my God, my Father, God of the heritage of Israel, Lord of heaven and earth, creator of the waters, king of all your creation, hear my prayer. Make my deceitful words bring wound and bruise on those who have planned cruel things against your covenant and against your sacred house, and against Mount Zion, and against the house your children possess. Let your whole nation and every tribe know and understand that you are God, the God of all power and might, and that there is no other who protects the people of Israel but you alone. So when she had finished praying and crying in a prostate position, she stood up and removed the sackcloth she had been wearing, took off her widow's garments, bathed her body with water, anointed it with oil, combed her hair, put on a tiara, dressed herself in the festive attire that she used to wear while her husband Manasseh was living, and she put sandals on her feet, put on her anklets and her bracelets and her rings and her earrings and all her jewelry, and she made herself very beautiful to entice the eyes of all the men who might see her. In fact, the men of, of, Ju of uh, Israel were astounded when they saw her emerge in this costume. She gave her maid a skin of wine and a flask of water of oil and filled a bag with roasted grain, dried fig cakes, and fine bread. And then she wrapped up all her dishes and gave them to her to carry. From here, she goes out to the enemy lines, looking as beautiful as she is with her maid. And she is quickly captured by the enemy, who she tells that she has information, inside information for General Holofernes. And of course, the men are astounded by her beauty, and that always makes things go a little smoother. So they bring her to the, the chief and let her tell him what she knows. And what she tells him is that she is betraying her people because they are about to sin against their God 
because of the food blockade. And therefore she tells Holofernes how to beat them. And he believes her. Um, she tells him that she will go out to pray and she will know from God when they are about to, be, to succumb and do the sinful thing of eating the first fruits of the harvest, the, har the, the things that are dedicated to God. And she will know and she will tell Holofernes and that is when Holofernes should attack. Uh, he believes her and then he goes on on the fourth day. For three days this goes on. She goes out to pray every single day. And on the fourth day, he creates a banquet for her. And of course, he's interested in seduction. And of course, he eats and drinks too much and falls asleep on the bed and she manages to kill him. Then she and her maid leave, take their leave as if they're going to pray again, go back to the Israelites, walk in the door, and the entire community rejoices to see her. They did not expect her back. They were amazed. She pulls out the evidence of the death of Philophanes. And then she instructs the Israelite army how to go about winning the battle. Uh, they are to amass themselves on the cliffside as if they're readying themselves for war. And when the general Holofernes forces see them, they will go to find the general and tell her, the chief and tell him that they need to get ready for war. And when they find him dead in his tent, they will scatter, which is exactly what happens. And they take advantage of the situation and Israel wins and they are able to loot and have great riches, which then Judith returns and dedicates to God. And after great celebration and her leading the people in song, the song is a song that kind of goes like, begin a song to my God with tambourines, sing to my Lord with cymbals, raise to him a new song, exalt him and call upon his name. For the Lord is a God who crushes wars. He sets up his camp among his people. He delivered me from the hands of my pursuers. The Assyrian came down from the mountains of the north, and he came with myriads of warriors. Their numbers blocked up the wadis, and their cavalry covered the hills. He boasted that he would burn up my territory, and kill my young men with the sword, and dash my infants to the ground, and seize my children as booty, and take my virgins as spoil. But the Lord Almighty has foiled them by the hand of a woman, for she put away her widow's clothing to exalt the oppressed in Israel. She anointed her face with perfume, she fastened her hair with a tiara, and she put on a linen gown to beguile him. Her sandal ravished his eyes, her beauty captivated his mind, and the sword severed his neck. Then my oppressed people shouted, my weak people cried out, and the enemy trembled. They lifted up their voices, and the enemy turned back. Woe to the nations that rise up against my people. The Lord Almighty will take vengeance on them in the day of judgment, and he will send fire and worms into their flesh, and they shall weep in pain forever. After 30 days of celebration and feasting in the land of Jerusalem, Judith then takes her leave. Her reputation has been secured. She is celebrated throughout the land for her bravery and her cleverness. She gets many, many marriage proposals, but rather than take another husband, she returns to widowhood. She returns to her home. She takes off her face. She puts on her widow's sackcloth, and she continues to fast every single day except the Sabbath in her grieving ritual for her husband. That is the story of the book of Judith. We have a song and then one more scripture. Oh, oh yeah, it's this song. Okay.
That song came to us from the national youth event of the UCC. They've had, they've given us some videos to use. That was back, way back last summer. And it's the Reformation Project is the, the artist. Um, the second scripture today I wanted to share with you was from the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 8, verses 4 through 11. To you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple, gain prudence. You who are foolish, set your hearts on it. Listen, for I have trustworthy things to say. Open my lips. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning of all, to the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. So those are the words of woman wisdom from the book of Proverbs. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So there's hardly more appropriate, a, a more appropriate woman to cap off our series of strong women in the Bible with because Judith is not only seems to be the strongest of them all, but she may actually be a conglomerate of all of the other biblical women. The first thing to know about this book, it's in the Apocrypha, which is not in our Bible, but it's in the Catholic Bible, is that it's not meant to be taken seriously as a historical record. It's more of a biblical novel meant to entice you with its metaphorical lessons or story. We know this because the story purposely misappropriates history and historical figures. First of all, there is no town named Bethulia. No one has been able to find evidence of that. In the first chapter of the book of Judith, the narrator puts the book in the age of Nebuchadnezzar and re repeatedly calls Nebuchadnezzar the king of the Assyrians. Six times he does that in the opening chapter. Nebuchadnezzar, however, was actually the king of Babylon, and other conquering king, the other conquering kingdom of biblical times. And a little later, one of the generals in Nebuchadnezzar's army recites the history of the people of Israel as he's explaining who they are, and goes all the way through from the history to the future that hasn't happened yet. So this signals to the reader that they are free to engage the story as a story or a metaphor or even a parody, perhaps, about a leader that is a current leader that they are not allowed to name for fear of retribution. It's also understood by the multiple meanings of the name Judith. Judith in Hebrew is the word for Jewess. It is also the feminine form of Judah, which is another name for Yahweh's kingdom. So with all that in mind, the story has kind of a V-shaped symmetry to it, where the focal point is the scene with Holofernes in his tent where he dies, and all the steps leading up to it, Judith, you know, emerging from Spencer woman, widowhood, speaking to the crowd, um, leaving the safety of the encampment with her maid, and then meeting with Holofernes. And then they return to the camp. She speaks again to the crowd, and then she returns to widowhood. So it's like this story that has a central point and some symmetry. The story also transcends and combines gender roles, allowing the character of Judith to be all genders at once. She begins as largely asexual. A widow is considered asexual, pious and celibate. And then she assumes the male role when she's speaking powerfully and authoritatively to the elders in the town square and chooses to risk sacrificing herself for the war. Then she transforms into a woman whose beauty even stuns the Jews when she goes to leave her camp. And then again in the killing scene, she has the strength and the gruesomeness of a soldier. And then she returns home and resumes the widowhood without marrying. She returns to gender neutrality. But the events and the characteristics of Judith's story harken back towards the stories of the other women we've discussed over these 10 weeks. 
some of which you may have recognized if you were listening carefully, although we didn't read all the scripture. But like Susanna, Judith is a woman of unassailable honor and piety and connection to God. She has a righteous existence in the eyes of God, and her prayer is heard. There is a Rahab-like character in the story, an outsider foreigner who comes into the Israelite camp, gives them great truth about their God, and then converts. Like in the story of Ruth, Judith is a widow who offers herself by lying at the feet of a man. And there are echoes of Ruth's stories when Holofernes says, which we didn't read, your, your God will be my God. Like in the story of Deborah, Judith is the one who rallies the Israelites in a time of war to make one more effort at freedom. And like the secondary female Jael in the story, Holofernes' death is at the hand of a woman in a tent and involves his head. And like Miriam and Deborah, the women lead the community in song and dance following the Israelite victory. According to a writer named Andre Lecoq, in the, a book called The Feminine Unconventional. Judith shows that a woman can take the lead and become the role model of faith and martyrdom while elders recoil in the holes of their complacency. At the time of the composition of Judith, it was surely not a trivial feat to feminize the hero of the day. So Judith is this caricature that embodies all the greatest traits of women in biblical history. She's faithful and honorable, fierce and determined, prayerful, thoughtful and clever, courageous and loyal, self-sacrificing, and concerned with the survival of Israel. As a woman willing to sacrifice herself for her future of her country, her story points forward towards another who would substitute himself for the future of mankind. And then in addition to all of those, Judith also parallels the words of woman wisdom, which is another woman that I thought about including in our series, but I didn't. Woman wisdom is the protagonist from the book of Proverbs, and she's sometimes likened to be the female form of Christ. Like Judith, woman wisdom speaks to persuade all the people in the square with the scripture that I read to you second. Listen, for I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. The phrasing that Judith uses matches the phrasing from the book of Proverbs. And so they think that Judith is the personified woman, wisdom from Proverbs. And her wisdom is to remind people of their identity with God. Judith calls on the people of Israel, even in times of crisis and suffering, to have faith and trust in hope. She reminds them of the qualities of the covenant with God. The God is the God of the lowly, the helper of the oppressed, the upholder of the weak, the protector of the forsaken, and the savior to those without hope. She reminds the Israelite people that God's strength does not depend on numbers, nor God's might on the powerful, but on the overarching power of God to save and claim and redeem. In Christ, early Christians used this book of Judith extensively when they were in times of crisis and struggle to show that God doesn't abandon his people, even in the hardest times. And therefore, people ought not abandon their God nor put him to the test. Now, to be honest, friends, I struggled to pull great meaning from this story. It's a good story, it's an interesting story. It's not terribly inspirational. And to be perfectly honest, I struggled this week to figure out how to be a pastor. Four years ago on my first Sunday here, I sat in these pews and I listened to Pastor Damon try to offer some words of comfort about the very divisive election, just like the one we had this week. <clears throat> I remember him saying that there were students at Hastings College on the campus who felt assaulted by the label of racist and bigot for their Republican vote. And there were students of color or students who felt vulnerable and scared for their futures at the same time. Everyone felt raw, and it's no less painful today. And so this is a hard time to be a pastor. I don't know how to go about 
loving and caring for you all, who I deeply love and care for. When I see what we're willing to do to each other, I mean, if I'm to believe what I read about what people think about my vote, then I'm walking through the grocery store, driving through town, visiting people who very sincerely believe I want to ruin this country and everything they hold dear. And that cuts both ways. It's not just one side. Both sides feel this weight of possibly being hated for their, by their neighbor or by some anonymous person in a grocery store. We are supposed to be Christians. We're supposed to be set apart by our love for each other. And we are assuming the worst about each other. We are actively believing what we want to believe. We are assuming we know what the other person believes, how the other person feels, especially when it's people we've never met. And I think what we're doing is worse than gossip. I think it's slander. Words have power, and mockery has power, and slander has power. I mean, we see that right last week in the biblical account that we studied. Last week's story of Susanna, she's framed by two elders who proposition her with the promise to slander her if she refuses, knowing that once they say it, she cannot stand up for herself knowing that once it's said, it cannot be unproven. Knowing that the hint of impropriety is all that's necessary to take the life of the woman who does not have a right to defend herself. And here in our age of social media, we're doing this to each other. We're slandering swaths of people we've never met based on what other people are telling us about them, but never asking them directly. As an organizer, I've long believed the only true and best way to defeat stereotypes and presumptions and suspicion is through personal relationship and face-to-face -face conversation, something that we are suffering a scarcity of right now. And that may go on for another year, another year of us living in our bubbles and not talking to each other and not having a chance to know our neighbor in the flesh. Without relationship and real personal conversations, the danger is we're only going to see these people with different viewpoints as anonymous and continue to think the worst of them. And they cannot explain themselves or stand up for themselves. We are called to encounter the world in love, to seek God's voice for redemption and reconciliation in all things. So I'm calling on you to interrupt that kind of talk. Not just to not do it yourself, but to interrupt it when you see it. To ask people what they believe. And to ask people to not assume about others. Because without it, I honestly don't know where we go from here. I don't know how we get back to who we used to be. I mean, perhaps we should look at the wisdom text. To you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. Listen, for I have trustworthy things to say. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just, and none of them are crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found the knowledge. And this is more valuable than gold or silver, for wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing can compare to it. I know this. I will pledge not to make any assumptions about anybody else's motivations to you right now. I will pledge to believe that every person wants what's best for this country. I will pledge to ask people what they think and why they think it, rather than assuming that I know the answer based on their t-shirt, or their picture on Facebook, or their vote, or their flag out front. Because friends, Jesus did this. Jesus just didn't go to just the people who were sick and the poor and the hungry. He didn't just go to the crippled and the demon possessed. He went to the people who were slandered. He went to the prostitute. He ate with the tax collector. He spoke to the Samaritan the wealthy Gentile, the Pharisee. He talked with them, he sat with them, he ate with them. 
He repeatedly told us and showed us that these people are just people. So let us seek the wisdom to have faith in God and trust in our covenant. Our covenant with God to love each other, to love God first and love our neighbor like ourselves. Our covenant with each other and our covenant with our country. After this very divisive election, which is still in process and we'll have multiple recounts before it's worked out. There are a lot of presumptions and stereotypes being floated that are helping us other each other, as in push other people away and not see their humanity. None of us seem to know who the others are, but we are sure that they are a danger to our America, however we see that America. So let us remember that we're first and foremost Christians, called to love each other. And secondly, we are all Americans who want what's best for this country. We may disagree on what that entails and how we get there, but let's not lose sight of the fact that we are in this together and this society doesn't work unless we trust each other and know each other and are willing to know each other. Because unlike Judith, we aren't in biblical times. We can't always assume that God is on our side and we certainly can't assume that God will come deliver us when what we need delivering from is ourselves. I pray that it's so, and we find our love for each other again. Amen. Our music this morning, our special music this morning, is called My Hope is Built by Edward Moat and Tom Trenney from Deb Sherrick and Kathy Gruber. Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not try. 
Does anyone have any joys or concerns they want to share this morning? Are there any prayer requests coming over the... Just that one. It was... I don't know if another one just popped up. Can you tell me? I don't have my phone. Oh. Praying for all people who are going through this transition at this time. Prayers to unite and heal the United States. We're also praying, thank you. Um, we're also praying this morning for Rose Hardy, who's had a series of very tests. Um, who's finally figured out after some year, some time of being in pain um, that there is an answer to her pain and we're praying for a, a successful outcome for that surgery and that she has an end to her pain soon. I'm sure she would love a phone call or a card if you have the time. Um, is there any other prayers, prayer requests for this morning? We, of course, as always, are, preparing, are praying for uh, Janine Johnson's full recovery. She is getting stronger. Um, I saw her this week. And we're praying for Bonnie's continued healing from her broken arm. Um, and we're praying for everyone affected by COVID, um, all the people who are uh, diagnosed and suffering and anxious and um, caring for someone with COVID or mourning someone who has passed. If there are no more joys or concerns, will you please be with me in a spirit of prayer? Holy God, as we finish our time, our walk through the strong women of the Bible. Let us be thankful for each life that has been shaped and touched by women, for the stories that have been ignored or forgotten, that we have reclaimed their worth, for leaders and liberators like Miriam or Deborah or Esther, for poets and prophets like Hulda, Anna, Mary, and Hannah, for apostles and activists like Mary Magdalene and Lydia and Priscilla, and for the named and the nameless, we give thanks for all of the women who are part of your holy story and who have added to the tree of life. And holy God, we pray at this time for our nation. During this time of reflection and turmoil and transition, may each of us soften our hearts with kindliness, that we may consider to one another, we listen to one another with respect and express our thoughts with humble clarity and always seek the good in the other as we strive to form a more perfect union under God. Let us pray for all, all people of faith and goodwill that we never lose hope in the mercy of God, even in the midst of chaos, let us pray for all who have been elected to serve in our national and local government. May those chosen to carry the burden of office be given wisdom to know what is right and just and be strengthened to always work for the common good. Let us pray for reconciliation among families and friends divided. May we learn to love each other despite our differences and focus on the work that continues beyond this election, the work of unity, respect for one another and for all life, and peace in our world. And we pray for those most affected by our choices this morning, God, those who are weak and vulnerable, those in whom we see the face of Christ, those afflicted with this virus, those afflicted with financial hardship because of this time of hardship. God, we ask for a quick, we ask for your help in finding a way through this virus and getting us back to normal, back to a place where we can spend time together and enjoy each other and find 
our way to common good, contentedness, real friendship, and understanding. God, we pray at this time we lift up to you those in our congregation who are struggling, who are in pain, who need your help and healing. We lift up to you, Janine Johnson, that she may continue to grow in strength. And we lift up to you, Bonnie Klingenberg, that she's able to get by better and better with a broken arm that hopefully will be gone soon. We pray for successful surgery, that you bless the hands of the surgeons that will work on Rose Hardy soon to help her with her back pain, that she will come back stronger and better and more ready to engage this life. God, we pray for everybody who's weighing on our hearts this morning. Everyone who's affected by the anxiety, the darkness, the coming winter. Knowing that you are with there, you are there with for us always. You are just a prayer away or a phone call away when we see you in others. We pray in the way your son taught us, your son who came here in human form to feel our feelings, to suffer through our struggles, to understand our anxieties, who healed and fed and spent time with all who asked. Your son Jesus Christ. We taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Do we have any announcements this morning? I know we have church council meeting on Tuesday, and we will be having a stewardship committee meeting on Monday at 6.30. Bill, did you have something you want to come up here? Good morning. Uh, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, we want to thank everyone for uh, their contributions throughout the year. Um, we were cash flowing quite well up until a couple of months ago, and then the giving has fallen off. And so we'd like to encourage everyone to um, be up to date on their pledges and um, make sure that they're, uh, uh, they're contributing uh, like they intended to. Um, and if you have you know, any extra at this point in time that you can contribute to the church, we certainly would appreciate it. So, thank you. Thank you, Bill. This week we'll have uh, children's time on Zoom at Wednesday at 1230. Fellowship for anyone who'd like to join Monday at 4. Tuesday at 2 we'll have Bible study and we'll be back on some normal Bible study scripture, so no longer 16 chapter books. Um, and you're wel anyone's welcome to join us. And with that said, I don't think there's any more announcements here. Oh, how did I forget that? Thank you. <laughs> next, um, next Sunday, Women's Fellowship has uh, generously decided that they want to nourish us with food. We will. They will be making our soups, our traditional soups, supper soups, and preparing them for carry out cold so that you can take them home and reheat them at home. Um, I want to give a huge generous thank you to Women's Fellowship for, for realizing that we need a little bit of, uh, I don't know, it's not fellowship because we won't be together, but a little bit of nourishment at this time and a little bit of warmth and connection. That's wonderful. Uh, also next Sunday will be Stewardship Sunday. We need to sign up and send Yes. Thank you. Uh, they are taking requests for soup, so please send an email or a text to Marilyn, whose uh, information is in the Big Mouth email, 
um, so that you can tell them how much soup you need so we prepare the right amount. Thank you. It will be, it'll be curbside delivery. Thank you. All right, so if there's no other announcements or is there any announcements coming over the internet? Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us today and please hear this benediction. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek God's will in all that you do. God's wisdom will direct your path. May it be so. Amen.